everybody, Stephen Clyde here. I've been excited to do this episode for such a long time, just to talk about ancient Ireland today. We're going to talk about anarchy in ancient Ireland. I'm joined today by Kevin Flanagan from the Brehan Law Academy. Um, you can find that at brehanlawacademy.ie. He's also the program manager at European Students for Liberty. He's done quite a bit of work in this area, and he's very, very knowledgeable. I, I'd say him and Gerard Casey are the two top experts in ancient Ireland. So, Kevin, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, just to start, I mean, tell us a little about yourself. Where did you end up politically over time? Um, yeah, tell us all I got okay, stuff. Well, uh, I really appreciated your introduction, but I would say that Jared Casey is the real expert. Uh, for me, this is something that I kind of picked up as, a, as an interest maybe back in 2008, 2009. Um, I started to become interested in the law in general, uh, legal philosophy and things like that. And I was really surprised when I first learned that Ireland had this legal system. Obviously, you can tell by my accent, but I'm also Irish. Um, and I couldn't I, tell, I, by the way. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. So, uh, yeah, this was kind of um, a real eye-opener for me at the time. You know, I, I was aware that you could look at law differently in the sense that you had a common law, you had legislation. And then I heard about this Breton law. And I'm also very interested in history and things like that, so uh, I became interested in this very quickly. And I'm going to brush over a lot of, of my past, maybe you can come back to it if you want, but, but uh, I subsequently ended up doing a law degree, um, not because I wanted to pursue a career as a solicitor or a barrister, but actually for that same reason, that I was interested in the jurisprudence, the legal philosophy, and um, at this stage I was already, uh, I would say, I don't like the word activist, but I was already becoming sort of like uh, socially active in terms of justice and so uh, I would say social justice, but not, not like social <laughs> justice warrior because it was before that was even a thing, right? But um, yeah, I was always interested in, in the relationship between, let's say, let's put it this way, the individual and the state. And a lot of people phrase that relationship around political ideas. But for me, actually, what was more fundamental to that relationship was the legal side of it. You know, po uh, political systems are like products of their legal system and vice versa. So if you want to really understand the nature of this society or the system that you're living in or any historical system, then the best thing to look at, in my opinion, is the laws that were uh, present at that time. Uh, in many ways, when you have a native uh, or a natural legal system, what you're witnessing is uh, kind of the, the character of the people to whom those laws relate to. Um, also their aspirations, like a lot of their kind of um, their hopes for society. You know, how do they deal with, with wrongdoing? How do they deal with injustice? How do they deal with, you know, um, I guess as a cor uh, correlation to that, the economy, politics and so on. So, I mean, that was back in 2008, I started to get interested in that. And uh, as you said, I also work for Students for Liberty. Um, I've worked for Students for Liberty for three years now. I was I joined as a volunteer in 2015. Uh, I joined the executive board in 2016, and then I became a staff member in the same year. Uh, and that journey, I would say, to, 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 towards libertarianism, quote unquote, the political libertarianism, took kind of a, a long time. But Real, really, when I think back to my youth and so on, I'm one of those people who would say I was always like this. I always had this way of thinking, uh, very pro, like personal freedom, very anti-authoritarian from a young age, and uh, maybe not having the context to call it libertarianism at the time, you know? So that was kind of a process that, that took a long time. And um, like before I knew about the concept of libertarianism in the political sense, I always associated with the American political party at first, uh, but I would have called myself maybe a free man or a sovereign or something like this. Uh, and how that relates back to the Irish law, well, I think that uh, there's a lot of myths and there's a lot of misconceptions about the Irish law. I think it's um, in many ways being kind of romanticized. Um, a lot of my bubbles and my preconceptions were burst as I, as I began to study it. But the reason why it's interesting to me is that it gives a, an actual historical example of a legal system and a functioning society that functioned in the absence of centralized government, centralized control. And that's a real fundamental difference. And just for anyone listening, you know, the things you're about to hear throughout this episode, I, I assume, Kevin, you're, you're, not, you're absolutely not arguing that ancient Ireland was this perfect paradise, but rather that relative to what we ex 
what we have today for sure. Um, they had a very much superior system to what we had today. In fact, before we start this discussion, I have four new liberty right in front of me. I want to read a, I want to read a quote real quick. For a thousand years then, ancient Celtic Ireland had no state or anything like it. As the leading authority on ancient Irish law has written, there was no legislator, no bailiffs, no police, no public enforcement of justice. There was no trace of state administered justice. Now, I guess the first question is, is that true? And the second question that relates back to what I asked you, I, I, I guess what we're arguing is relative to, to everything else. You know, ancient Ireland was a pretty good system. Um, okay, yeah, I, I'll have to say yes, it was a pretty good system, but it depends on what metrics you're using to, to say what's good, okay? Because yeah. uh, some people might have a different set of metrics for determining what's good, but there were certainly aspects of it that we would say may not be desirable in today's society, and we can talk a little bit uh, about that as well. But I would say on the whole, um, the principles that we can kind of extrapolate from this system are principles that can uh, could potentially benefit society today um, and, and I just want to give a little caveat here as well like ancient Irish anarchy it sounds great it has a catchy title people get there the people get interested in it but the uh, ancient Irish they didn't consider themselves as anarchic like they weren't going around and pr promoting anarchy as some sort of like uh, value to aspire to right. they weren't they didn't have words like libertarian and very interestingly they didn't have this left-right dichotomy that we have in politics uh, you know, socialism versus capitalism. So what I find also very interesting about this system is where those two concepts overlap. And there were some aspects of it that we might call socialist, or they had social uh, safety nets and so on. And there was also aspects of it that, you know, you had to go out and you had to, like, make the most of the resources that you had. You had to make a better life for yourself, and nobody was going to do that for you. So it is inter it's interesting to look at it that way. And yes, there was no police, there was no bailiffs, there was no prisons as such, apart from maybe some natural prisons on islands and that sort of thing. Um, and the, the, so, so how did the legal system work? How uh, is this something that we could even describe as a legal system based on our modern understanding of what this is? Um, and the quickest way to give an answer to this is to say that the law was polycentric. What does that mean? It means that the law was focused on the people. So. Let me just maybe give you an example of how a law came into existence. Um, people would engage in social activities in the marketplace or, you know, they'd go about their daily business. And over time, a certain way of doing things would happen, like a habit would form. And this habit then would become a custom. And if this custom existed for a long enough period of time, it would be considered to be the way things are done and it becomes what we would call as a law. So uh, the Irish laws, what I always found very like mystical and interesting about them was how they were described as being around since time immemorial. They were as old as the hills or as old as the rocks, beyond living memory. But when you realize that that's only 90 years, it doesn't sound so mystical and so ancient. Uh, the reason I say 90 years is because up to about three generations of people. Uh, after three generations, the youngest generation, like this custom would have been around for longer than anybody can remember, so it became a law. So uh, the law could change then actually when customs changed and when new ways of doing things came about over time, a better way of doing it, a more efficient way of doing it, then gradually the law would change. And it was actually the, the, the activities and the interactions of the people as they went around about their business that shaped and molded this law. Not a centralized body, which could be a king or could be a government, who were kind of trying to like anticipate future occurrences and make a law or a rule in advance of, of, of uh, future events. And now this is where the Brehens come in. The, Bre the reason why we call it the Brehen Law, I should say, is the ancient Irish legal system, the native system, is called Brehen Law today. And the word Brehen comes from the anglicization of the word Brihiv. Brihiv is the Irish word for a judge. So it became known as the Brehan Law, the law of the Brehans. Uh, we would call them judges, but they're very different from the type of judges that we have, and we could maybe go into more details on that as well. But their role was to, um, to know the customs that the people were using amongst themselves. They were to keep a record of the customs that were you know, already happening in society, and to, to know the correct way to adjudicate a case. 
interestingly, and I'll, I'll finish on this, is that the, the, the law was not about finding fault with people in the same sense as ours is. Like, it wasn't, okay, there was aspects of it that we could describe as punishment, but it wasn't the purpose. They accepted that human beings are going to, like, make mistakes, and sometimes they'll do, they'll make bad decisions, and they can cause wrongs either accidentally or willfully. The purpose of the law was to find an outcome to a dispute that was harmonious, that, that sort of, like, rebalanced the, or offset the suffering that was caused, whether intentionally or unintentionally, by the actions of somebody else. Well, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, I guess one thing I want to start by talking about is ancient Ireland was absolutely not um, an illiterate, you know, non-functioning society. They had very much um, high literacy rates. And uh, yeah, tell me about that. Okay, um, that's a great question. And it's kind of um, a little bit contentious as well because uh, the, 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 the age of literacy, let's say, in Ireland began, they say, scholars say, at the coming of Christianity. So uh, St. Patrick allegedly came to Ireland in, I think, 432 AD. And with this, it created a great shift in the country because uh, in that era, immediately following St. Patrick, uh, the island became more Christian and you see less like warring, less fighting, that sort of thing. And the written word, even today in Ireland, where we have like, you know, I mean, in recent history, we have great authors like Joyce and Yeats and, and Wilde. That comes from a very old, like, uh, cultural uh, love for the written word and a cultural respect for the written word that goes very far back. What's interesting is, though, um, we have in some of the manuscripts mentioned that when Patrick came to Ireland, that the Irish already had books. So, you know, there's, there's a case to be made there that there was already a culture of writing and, and uh, a kind of an, you know, an intellectual class. Of course, there was in Ireland before St. Patrick. Now, the reason it's contentious is because um, in the uh, uh, 1166, I believe, uh, we had the Anglo-Norman invasions. And we had a Gaelic culture, a Gaelic order, we could say, the Gaelic Ireland, which gradually began to get eroded. And in line with that, manuscripts were lost, destroyed, stolen, schools were, were shut down, you know, the culture was gradually eroded to the point where now I'm speaking English to you and it's very hard to find Irish people who will actually speak Irish or can even... Really? Under, yeah, well, I mean, there is, there is a, a community of Irish speakers in the West Coast, but we study it in school for maybe 12 years and it's, it's hard to have a conversation with somebody in Irish. You know, I guess one, uh, one thing I just want to want to touch on real quick, what time period are we talking about here when we're talking about ancient Ireland? Uh, okay, well, it probably isn't accurate to say ancient Ireland, to be honest. It's, it's more to say early Ireland in the sense that uh, Fair enough. we're going from the, the period of the written record, which they started to be written down in the, like, 6th, 7th centuries. Uh, well, that's the, that's the oldest surviving manuscripts that we have. Now, what we do know from linguistic evidence and, you know, the mythology is that this, um, well, the system was an oral system originally. Uh, it actually goes back to the Druids. And our mythologies and our, you know, um, cultural identity is obviously much older than that time. It's just that they began to get cut, written down in, with paper uh, around that, that period. So, so if, uh, when we look at the mythologies, which also the, the, the manuscripts from the mythologies were, were starting to get written down around the same time. And some people... Uh, who researched this point out that, that there's a problem here that actually all of this was written by Christian monks. If it's written by Christian monks, well then there's going to be, uh, you know, the risk of bias creeping in. Um, my feeling on that is that for the most part they, they try to keep true to the customs that were already there because it would be very hard to kind of alter or change those customs because they were embedded into the, into the culture. But um, in one of the, the, the uh, um, in one of the earliest mythological accounts that we have of people coming to Ireland, uh, there's, a, there's a story about a, a, a court case that happens. So, I mean, you can't believe the myths because they're myths, but this is supposed to be an age in like antiquity where we, you know, very, very distant past BC. And um, the court case was interesting because it actually recognized, the judgment of this case recognized the right of the wife to, to, to sue a husband. And I just find that interesting because our, our Breton law is often held up as being like very pro uh, women's rights for its time. And for its time it was, but for today maybe not so much. But it's interesting that uh, the very first 
court case that's in our mythology, if you do it chronologically, uh, recognizes the right of a wife to sue her husband. Um, so, so it's difficult to say with any certainty like exactly the period, and because we're, we're talking about thousands of years of Irish history, and I'm glossing over and making broad strokes here that, that um, maybe for the benefit of your listeners, it's, it's good to be aware that this is a very long timeline, and at different points on the timeline, there was like, you know, uh, different factors of the law took greater precedence. So later into the Christian era, there's a lot more of like canon law influence on the laws. There's a lot more like of the church's influence on the laws in the later era. But if you go further back, then it's more, let's say, pagan, for want of a better phrase. You know? When we think about like a nation nowadays, you know, one thing Murray Rothbard points out in a lot of his books is that for a nation to go to war, you have to get the whole of the people to feel like they're the ones being attacked. But something you point out is that um, uh, in early Ireland, they had over 140, what would you consider private countries per se, or private um, how, how would you describe that? It, it, it wasn't at all like one big, you know, we the government. Yeah, okay, so, and there's a couple of strands to that line of thinking. Um, okay, so the, 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 the social, or let's say the political unit was called the Tua. The plural will be Tuaha. And you could loosely translate this to say like a tribe, but it's also a nation or a people or a land, actually. It's kind of all these phrases are packed into this word, Tua. Uh, and the reason why we believe that there was around, at any one stage, 140, 150 of these Tuaha was uh, through evidence of genealogies. Because each Tuaha was, was connected to a, a principal clan, a principal family. Um, and this was a very kin-based system. Like, the family was an incredibly important part, an incredibly important unit. In fact, the family was a legal unit. If, uh, for example, you committed an offense, your family would be um, the, the accused. Your whole family would have, 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 uh, have, have to respond to that. And vice versa, if someone committed an offense against you, your whole family was the, the legal entity, let's say. So uh, looking at genealogies, we can see that maybe there was uh, 150 powerful families. And around these powerful families, they would have their, their family lands and the society of the tour grows up around that. So um, is that compatible with today's society? I don't know. Maybe, like, there's, there's a, maybe a conversation for near the end here to talk about how this could work in a modern context. Uh, but yeah, it was based around the family. And, and what I often say to Irish people, that if, if you have an Irish name, uh, Irish family name, then you're descended from royalty. But that doesn't make you anything special because everybody in Ireland who was a free person was considered to have that degree of individual sovereignty intact as part of their clan unit. So within each clan, they would uh, the people who were eligible to elect, they were called the Rigdauna, that means the, the people with kingly material, kingly qualities, um, could be elected within the Tua to be the representative of that Tua, the chieftain, the Ri, um, and that was like the king. So each of these two, Ireland was not a united country, which is really interesting in the modern context because we hear like Northern Ireland, Southern Ireland, this, this whole right, um, exactly. conflict that's been going on for so long. But really, if you look at Irish history carefully, it's, it's hard to find a time when Ireland was ever united in its history. Maybe under the King Brian Baru, that's a different story just for a short period of time. But Ireland was like, the, the culture and the mindset of the people was very, um, let's say like independent and autonomous and like the Flanagans, my clan, had their piece of land and that was their territory and that was Flanagan country. Even you can look at the place names in Ireland, um, which I know especially to Americans they can seem a bit strange when we have American tourists coming over to Ireland and they have very a lot of difficulty pronouncing these names. Uh, <laughs> but, but they all come from Irish and if you understand a bit of Irish you can see that these place names have a meaning. So you take County Tyrone, for example, in the north of the country, which in Irish is Tyrone, it means owns country, and that was the, the country of the descendants of the, the Kennel Own, the, the own clan. And um, so there's a lot of examples like that. The tour itself kind of operated, acted as, as a socio-economic hub, um, like there was an economy within the tour, and people for the most part would stick to their own tour. Okay. Um, and there is a reason for that, because your legal status was dependent upon your family. Your legal status was dependent, not just dependent upon your family, but dependent upon the acceptance in the minds of your neighbors that you had legal status. 
So it was, your reputation was very important, and you had a good reputation in the eyes of your neighbors, then you had good standing and you, your word was respected. Now, if you moved to another tua, you were now a durad, which means an outsider, which means like you would be not necessarily be attacked or anything for that, but you wouldn't have a legal status in the village, in the, in the tua. So if you caused an offense, you could get into a lot of trouble. The flip side of that is if somebody caused an offense against you, even as an outsider, it was the responsibility of the tua to make sure justice was, was seen to be done for you. Um, so yeah, you didn't have a legal standing as such, but you would still be protected by the law. Um, you weren't an outlaw, you were just an outsider. So This is a really good segue. I guess we could talk about how was law and order taken care of in that society? Well, I, I'm gonna link to your Tom Woods episode you were on. Let's see here, I have it written down somewhere. I'll, I'll, I'm gonna link to the, the episode you were with on Tom Woods, but you're talking about how um, the idea of restitution over, um, uh, um, you know, punishing somebody physically, um, that, that's what's valued. So what's the idea of rep restitution? Okay. Um, well, like I mentioned at the, earlier on in, in the call here, that, that uh, the, the, the rationale that the judge, the Brehan, was guided by was to find an outcome that would, like, re set off the harm, set off the loss that was caused by one party to another. Uh, that's restitution. And uh, having st uh, studied law like, uh, academically, I know that uh, within a lot of uh, like legal uh, scholarly discourse, there is this big talk about restitution now. They call it restorative justice. And the idea is like the, it's a question between, well, is it right that we use punishment as as like a, a a justice a tool of justice uh over restitution so i mean i guess an example of that would be um um yeah like let's say somebody uh, home is broken into and their property is stolen uh the offender is caught and brought to justice as it happens now um, that person might go to jail and now the victim doesn't get any compensation for that. The victim is still without their property. So the, the, that's not how it would have been done in the Brehan Law. Under the Brehan Law, the, the perpetrator would, be, uh, would have to restore that loss. And because it was a willful wrong, there was extra kind of um, fines on top of, you know, if, if I just called an, caused an accidental wrong, I had to compensate for the accident. But if it was willful, then there was extra fines on top of that that accounted for the fact that it was intentional and we want to have a deterrent, so the fine was, was greater. Um, so that's, that's kind of restitution in a nutshell. Uh, and uh, see, when you have a system where you have no central body to appoint judges, okay, um, no, no political bias, you could say, to appoint judges over cases where judges have a, mon uh, a monopoly and um, they are um, immune from suit, as, a, as we have in our systems. And um, what's what you're left with then is kind of a judicial open market where kind of anybody could act as a Brehan if they were asked to do so by the, by the parties. And what this does then is it creates this uh, market where the, uh, the reputation of the judge is really important. So if you were a judge who sort of gave bad judgments or you gave an incorrect judgment, that word would spread around, and then people are less likely to come and ask you for your services again, right? Uh, and and co like, by comparison to that, if you're really good, if you're fair, if you're not biased, if you're if you understand the customs of the people and you're able to interpret them and articulate them in a way that makes sense, then your services were were, were sought after. So part of the the role of the judge then was to to be that person who could who were kind of. I should say that the, the Brehan came about at a later point in the history. If you go further, further back into the history, this was the Druid. Um, the Druid is a very interesting p person from, from history, the, the group of people from history we don't know a lot about, very mystical. But they were kind of like wise elders whose judgment was sought to help the neighbors, help their kin, uh, their clan, their Tua, to, to, to find a you know, a reasonable outcome to, to a situation. So well, correct, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, a lot of their traditions were passed down where law nowadays is, there may have been a, a hundred laws like I added to the books today. I, there, there's a book by uh, Harry Silverglade, it's called Three Felonies a Day. In America, 
Um, at any given point in time, you're most likely committing like three felonies at a time, even if you're doing nothing because there's so many laws in the books. I imagine mm -hmm. in, in, in the ancient sense, it's kind of the opposite that you have a set of traditions, a set of laws that people are aware of, and that's it. You know, the, like uh, the two of the, the judge doesn't have the power to, you know, tax people or do all these things that they can nowadays. Absolutely. And, and um, what's interesting, how, how that law works then is that it needs to be fundamentally based on principle and it needs to be principles that people actually hold and people understand and are valuable to them and then if you have a law system based on principle well then the detail is easy to extrapolate because because you're always going to come back to these first principles but what we have is we have a system that's like over over the top with details that we've almost lost the principles along the way you know um, and it's all maintained by the central body, which in a way doesn't even make sense. It, it makes much more sense that, you know, I have my private community over here. You have yours over there. We can communicate with each other. But, you know, the, the fact that I would try to come now and try to rule over you and try to rule over both our territories, it, it can, can cause nothing but error. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, with something like justice, there should be some, um, I don't want to say, like, there should be some, something deeper than respect for the law. Like, in our system, we have phrases like, you know, don't get on the wrong side of the law. It's something to be afraid of. People drive down the streets and they see a cop car, and they might not even be doing anything wrong. But as you say, maybe they are. They don't know. And people get nervous, and people get afraid when they see the, the enforcers of the law, where really, if the, just, if the system was really just a system, then why would you feel uh, nervous or intimidated? When you see this, and I think that part of the problem is, it's like that we've lost that connection to the law, that were that it was ours, that it was part of us, that it was for our benefit, that we understood it. So um, there was a, an Irish barrister who who wrote on this topic, and he's uh, this was still in the time before Irish independence, I believe, and um, maybe in the last century, he wrote saying that the Irish irreverence for law it doesn't stem from sympathy with crime, but the Irish who have a long memory realize that the law in Ireland today is not Irish law. And however just it might be, and it was once most unjust, it does not command uh, reverence as a native institution. That's the key, reverence as a native institution, but just respect as an essential part of the machinery of government. And I think what, so, we'll, talk, what we'll talk about next is kind of how this became undone, but you give an example in one of your talks, you talk about an Ireland versus Austria a football match, and I guess someone in the match had their wallet stolen or something. So tell me about that and tell me how that relates back to the, the, this idea. Okay, so um, just keep the idea of restitution in mind here, but just to kind of flesh it out a little bit, um, you know, if, as I said, if you caused wrong to somebody, it was you or your clan's responsibility to, to rebalance that wrong, to offset that wrong. Now, what happens in the case where you are an outsider, you're an outsider, ad, you come to my community, Somebody, we don't know who, mugs you. Somebody harms you, damages you in some way. It was a principle of the law. It was a principle of the community that you had to get justice. You had to be restored because we don't want you to leave our community and go to the next town and say, those guys over there, they, I just got mugged in their community. They don't have a respect for justice. Like It gives a bad reputation to our entire community. So first of all, the first thing this creates is a social incentive to actually bring offenders to justice. So if I knew that it was my cousin who had done this, and if, if he doesn't get brought to justice, my family and every other family is going to have to pay you money mm. to restore you, like an insurance, social insurance, I guess, <laughs> for want of a better phrase, but like an insurance. Uh, well, then it kind of creates, a, it's a self-executing justice system. Okay, so, so there's that side to it. Uh, this was called a secret crime. When a secret crime was committed within the precincts of the Tua, it became the responsibility of the Tua by proxy of the, of the king, you know, uh, um, to, to restore you to justice. So what happened is, um, many, many millions later, bringing it up to more or less modern times, I think it was around 2000 and, um, 2009, there was a, a, a friendly international football match happening in Ireland, in Dublin. And it was, as you said, Austria versus Ireland. And a couple of Austrian, a couple, uh, came to visit Ireland and they were doing all the touristy things, you know, they wanted to go see the Guinness factory and they were seeing the sights. And then um, 
somewhere along the way, they got mugged on the street. And obviously, they didn't know who mugged them. They took their wallets and their phones, and they, they ran away. Somehow or another, the Irish fans found out about this and you know like football teams have their fan clubs and things like that so the fan club found out about this and they they put it out on the internet saying like you know more or less saying people have been wronged visitors to our land have been wronged it's our responsibility to make sure that we fix this and they did a whip around or we say like a collection for money uh, they actually raised more money than that was stolen so that was then given to a charity and they contacted the football association of ireland to get them replacement tickets. So that's restitution. That's a great example of it in a modern context. And do you know what? Like nobody had to tell them to do that. That didn't have to be written into law. Like, you know, exactly. if it's a legislation, if somebody comes and this happens to them, it's, it was felt that this was the right thing to do. And by and the way, I, 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 misunderstood I misunderstood the story at first. Um, um, sorry, Mac, sorry, no. Mac, uh, I misunderstood, uh, I misunderstood the story first. I thought it was thought about, it. Um, one of the Irish uh, players was hurt and like all the people from Ireland were coming to protect their Irishmen. Well, it was actually the opposite. It was someone from outside the country who was wronged. And to keep up the, the tradition, they said, hey, you know, we're going to, we don't want people to be wronged in our country because this, is, this isn't the way we are. Yeah, and I think the important thing to point out here is that, that those people didn't realize they were keeping up a tradition. Like it wasn't, they were like, oh, under Brehan Law, we used to do this, so let's do it again. It was just, that was felt to be the right thing to do, and it was the right thing to do. And it, that's It's kind of like you said, the Irish have a long memory. Yeah, yeah. And I, well, I would say it's like justice in action. Justice is not a philosophical idea. It's something that, I mean, it's felt. It's something that you know when you're being treated unfairly because you feel it in your stomach. You're like, no, I'm, I, I'm being treated unfairly. So um, maybe I can tell you a quick story from, from the mythology that, that, highlights this, that highlights this as well. It's the judgment of Cormac. So Cormac was one of our like, most famous mythological kings. People generally believe he was a historical character, obviously with a lot of like, mythological characteristics put onto him. Um, but to make the long story boring, uh, is, uh, he, his, his, um, he was raised in hiding because the, his father was previously king, uh, uh, King Art. And he was killed and the throne was kind of like usurped and taken by someone who we would say was not like rightful king. Um, because he was a usurper, right? He wasn't elected, but he was using force uh, to, to kind of um, to keep the kingship. And so Cormac was raised as a young boy um, outside of public life. And uh, at the Hill of Tara, which was one of our most significant political centers, it was the seat of the High Kings, and this is where the story supposedly took place, there was a young farmer woman who had a sheep. And the farmer woman's name was Benade. And Benade's sheep once escaped and managed to get into the, uh, the where the queen kept special crops that are called woad and they were for dyeing clothes. Very expensive crops. And the sheep began to eat these crops. So that was a, a case of animal trespass. Uh, actual loss had happened. It was a clear case for uh, a, a law, you know, for, for them to go to law to, 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 to dispute this. Um, kings could also take the role of a Brehan. In fact, a king was considered to have, a good king should have the judgment of a Brehan, in the same way we might say the judgment of King Solomon, you know. They, they were supposed to be judges and to be fair and be able to, to articulate the principles also. So she consulted her husband, the usurper, and his judgment of, of this uh, scenario was that, okay, well, you know, the crops have been destroyed and you need to give restitution, so you should give your sheep as restitution to the queen for the crops. Now, that sounds fair. But upon hearing this judgment, there was a young, young man coming of age in the crowd, and he shouted out, so this is the false judgment. This is an incorrect judgment. And then the interesting thing with the Brehan Law was very poetic, and they tried to always articulate it in terms of principles of nature that were observable in nature. So he said, as the crops will grow back on the land, so will the wool on the sheep's back grow back on the, on the sheep. So you should shear the sheep of its wool and give the wool as restitution to the queen so not deprive this lady of her livelihood. Now, both of those are good. They're, they're both answers to the problem. But one of them is, is, is qualitative, qualitatively a much better outcome because you, you feel it. And then the story goes that the people who were in attendance, because often these were done in the open air that anybody could watch, 
were taken aback by this and said, this is surely the judgment of a king. And this is how Cormac became recognized as the son of his father, and then eventually he became king. One of our great kings who apparently wrote a manuscript called the Book of Ackel, which is a book of Breton law that deals with the um, kind of wrongs, civil wrongs, uh, harm, harm and stuff like that, rather than, uh, you know, civil cases. Well, this has been endlessly insightful. You know, sometimes I'm worried I'll have guests on. We'll get get through all the information in 10 minutes, and it'll just be like an awkward silence. I mean, we've gone on for nearly 40 minutes now. Um, really? Okay. Wow. Yeah, no, it, I, like I know. Said, I, I've been wanting to have either you or Gerard Casey on to, to talk about this for such a long time. You've answered pretty much all my questions. Um, but well, I guess let, let, let's wrap up here by talking about how did some of this become undone? Because you mentioned the, the 11th century. You mentioned um, in 1367, the statute of Kilkenny. So how did some of this start to become undone? I mean, it was a very long process. Um, uh, and and so, uh, I guess when you take a cursory glance at Irish history, people think of England, they think of Britain, the uh, colonization. Like Ireland was colonized long before it was popular, like long before imperialism was a thing. They perfected their art of colony, the brutal art of colony in Ireland before they exported it to other places. Um, and there's even parallels in modern pop culture. So you know in Game of Thrones where you have the, the Red Wedding where they're all killed. I mean, that was that was happening a lot in Ireland. And like families were just wiped off the planet because the rules of hospitality forbade you from refusing an invitation. So you would go for, for this meal and then you'd just be kind of like, you know, family would be wiped out. Uh, mm -hmm. And it was, it was pretty brutal. I mean, uh, but I'm not one of these people who... who like blames English people or anything like that because you have to take a wider view of history and actually there's a role of the Vatican in this as well which a lot of Irish people aren't uh, at first aware of uh, because at the time like kings couldn't really move without the consent of the Vatican you know like the, the, the Vatican was the the kind of authority of all of Christendom hence like when the Vatican said later on that okay it's okay to do the Crusades that's the only time the kings actually started to do Crusades because the Vatican gave consent so I mean it's a long story probably longer than we have time to go into here but actually the the, the English the Anglo-Normans let's say were invited into Ireland by an Irish uh, king king of Leinster called Dermot McMurrow the reason they were invited in and and, and I've got like so many things popping into my head here. Like the 150 kingdoms were usually kicking the crap out of each other so much that they weren't concerned with the fact that the Vikings came first of all, uh, the Christians came, and then like uh, the Christians first, and the Vikings, and then the Anglo Normans. So the Anglo Normans kind of set up a base in what was called the Pale, areas of Dublin, Wexford, Wicklow, Kilkenny, um, and the English law operated inside the Pale, the, the law of the crown, while the Irish law operated everywhere else. And as you mentioned, the Statutes of Kilkenny came out in then 1367, was the first uh, piece of law that was directed at the English settlers. It's nothing to do with the Irish, but what it's saying to the, I say English, it's more accurate to say Anglo-Normans, but uh, uh, what it's saying to the Anglo-Norman settlers is, you know, like, why are you guys cutting your hair like the Irish? Why are you wearing Irish clothes? Why are you speaking Irish language? And if you go to a Brehan for justice, you are now a traitor to the king. The first piece. So the question that you have to ask there is like, well, why were these people who were aristocrats in their own right, who were granted title and lands uh, to stay in Ireland, why were they turning to these other customs? Why were they turning to the Breton law? Like my, I would say because they probably felt that it was a better system, it was more just and it was it was fairer. Later on, then we had a Gaelic revival when the English order, like the Anglo-Norman order, started to kind of decline in its power, and these same settlers became what we call the the uh non the gael fane more irish than the irish themselves these anglo normans and they were actually protecting the order in some way they were like patrons to the to the poets they were patrons to the brehans and this sort of thing um, and even like the name like fitzgerald okay john fitzgerald kennedy one of the most famous irish american you know fitzgerald is an anglo norman name but nobody in ireland would ever like think of it as not being Irish because they became adopted by the Irish, they became more Irish than the Irish themselves. Um, and so it was a long drawn out process. Um, like in Ireland, I should have mentioned that there was a, there was a very like um, distinct hierarchy. And there wasn't an egalitarian system, it wasn't an equal system. And if we had more time, it would be interesting to go into that. But um, uh, they had this mindset of like, you pay deference to a stronger king. 
you you gave him tribute. You 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 know respected a, 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 the, the power of a stronger king, and uh, King Henry was incredibly strong and powerful. And he uh, he landed with his armies at one point in Ireland because he was afraid the Anglo Normans were going to kind of like rebel against him and set up their own kingdom. So he came with like this massive army, the likes that the Irish had never seen anything like this before. And they just kind of the Lord started to like bow to him and give him respect. And then fast forward another another while, and we had this idea of surrender and regrant which was a policy by the crown which said that you surrendered your Irish title as chieftain and you were granted an English title as an earl or a lord. And gradually, gradually, like more and more kind of allegiances were, were done and it came to the point where uh, Northern Ireland, which is ironic because like Northern Ireland is today part of the United Kingdom, but right. back then Northern Ireland was the last, you know, last stand of Gaelic culture where you had the O'Neills and the O'Donnell clan who were refused. So, I mean, there was like so many allegiances and then they were broken and blah, blah, blah. But more or less, they refused to give up their Gaelic culture. culture. They refused to give up their Breton law. This culminated in the Battle of Kinsale, I think was in 1601, where they were like completely defeated. It was a horrible defeat. It was probably one of the most one-sided battles in Irish history. And then very soon after that, in 1607, we had the flight of the earls, which is the flight of the chieftains. When the last of the great Irish chieftains left Ireland, they went to like, the likes of Italy and France to try and get support and, and Catholic Spain to try and rally support for the cause. But actually the, the damage was already done and like because the, this, the order was based upon like the chieftains and the Brehans and all of this, that it began to collapse in place of the, of the English crown law. And last thing I'll say in this, we had the Cromwellian uh, campaigns which were absolutely brutal, like we're talking brutality, where Irish were displaced, murdered, in, in like thousands and thousands, and the famine, all of this. We also had the penal laws, which were laws introduced by the British Crown, the the, the establishment, that would uh, like refuse. Like Catholics weren't allowed to own property or inherit property. They weren't allowed to. You weren't allowed to speak your language. You weren't allowed to, you know, uh, use your own customs. Which is why Irish people don't speak Irish, because it was know, actually. Legal uh, to when people think about Ireland, I guess a lot of them may know about Cromwell moving forward. Is Cromwell still, from what I've heard, Cromwell still kind of like hated in, in Ireland nowadays? Is, is that still true? Well, yeah. I mean, but I say it's culturally true. It's not like we're, it's, people aren't really talking about it at the pub or something like that, you know. But it comes up in conversation from time to time, and especially the circles that I would, you know, move in and being interested in this. One of the issues I think that people some people don't know anything about, but those who do are very sad about, is the deforestation of Ireland. Like Ireland, we did have cities, of course, and we had like little clusters of, of like um, residencies and Tua, but for the most part, we were lived uh, in, in the forest. It was a very forested and um, land, and even you can read uh, travel guides, I mean, tra travel journals from people who visited Ireland in the 1500s, 1600s, and they talk about this, how like they'd be walking through the forest and all of a sudden they'd come across like a family. So they're very forest people. Even, I mean, I, 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 this is a bit of conjecture here, but I, I have had conversation with someone who made this parallel between the word like forest and foreigner, like someone who's outside of the, the law of the city, you're, you know, um, the wild men, if you want, who, who lived in the forest. Um, um, when the Cromwellian uh, campaigns happened, like there was massive deforestation and the wood was obviously exported um, for trade and, and everything uh, by Britain. But I think that that's a, that's a tear in the Irish psyche that we haven't actually dealt with. Same with the famine. It's wrong to call it a famine. It's an insult to those people who died to call it a famine. When, you know, when we know now through historical documentation that food by massive amounts were being exported on ships. It's like potatoes failed. Okay, but have you ever been to Ireland? We have lots of food. It's one of the, like, one of the most fertile uh, soils in, in Europe. I mean, everything grows there. We have cattle, we have pigs, we have, you know. Uh, so to think that just because the potato crop failed that everything else wasn't there. Is, is just wrong. So that's another scar that we never dealt with. Uh, then the portrayal of the church in more recent times, and I don't want to get like dark here and end on a down note, but like the, the, the abuses of the church and the scandals of the church with the mother and baby homes, the Magdalene laundries, the, the abuse of, of, of children in schools, that's another scar that we've never dealt with. And uh, Actually, Sinead O'Connor has an interesting song about this called, called The Famine, and it's like, 
Irish people, we have this stigma around the world of being like great drinkers, you know, or alcoholics and stuff like that. Well, there's a part of a reason for that. I think that as a, as a society, as a, as a people, we have a collective sort of depression. Like, you know, we're abused as, as when we were in our infancy and now we're like adults and we still have all of these traumas that most of us don't want to deal with, you know? And then, like, there's no fighting, there's no such thing as fighting Irish anymore. Like, there's no real, like, passionate, wild, like, you know, drive for this culture, for this identity, for, you know, a um, sense of, of, of greatness in ourselves and who we are and where we come from because we've just been beaten, 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 beaten so long. We're great at suffering. We can withstand a lot of suffering, but uh, sort of like a sense of pride, a sense of like, you know, yeah, a sense of pride is something that we don't have a lot of in Ireland. You know, we suffer from Catholic guilt and stuff like that. So, like, I, can, I can hear it in your voice that, you know, some of these old traditions probably I wish you could bring back. But over time, statism just gets itself ingrained into the society and just in the minds of people. And they become numb to it all. They don't realize they're part of this big colluded system that doesn't really make sense that you're, you're represented. Uh, we have very few people in, in, in power representing all of us. And it doesn't really actually make sense. So, uh <laughs> And it also is it's about outsourcing responsibility. I mean, the yes, state yes. Is, is is great. It's really convenient if you don't want to take responsibility for your life. You know, <laughs> yeah. Right? If you want to blame somebody for like all your problems, like you know, uh, okay, I'm I'm, in, I'm based in Europe, but I see this like huge anti-Trump rhetoric that's happening. Okay, and a lot of it is justified, but it's like, you know, people are stuck in traffic for work, and they're like, damn Trump. It's like it must be so great to have somebody something that you can blame all of your problems on you know and i think yeah. the is that. and i believe it was <laughs> i believe it was thoreau who said something like you know i'm paraphrasing badly here but like you know freedom in freedom you suffer your 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 burdens and you enjoy your successes yourself you have no you don't thank the government when you achieve something like you know you get you start your business or you you whatever it is that, that you consider to be an achievement in your life or a failure we, we use the government for this you know well, it, reminds, it reminds me of the old joke that you know why is the government involved with marriage imagine like you find a partner it's like you know me and you baby we got something so good let's go to the government to certify this <laughs> yeah yeah like get them in as a third party so 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 to come back to the point of like reviving these old laws i mean this is this is the, i'll give you an i'll give you two examples one from history or or recent one is uh, the one from history is like we had a like a land um the land league uh in the run-up to independence and like agitation against the english crown we were fighting for independence there was the land league and these were people like so the irish had now at this stage become renters they were renting land from english nobles and they were poor peasant farmers and uh like um daniel o'connell one of our great like statesmen uh, uh, Michael David, people like this, were touring the country giving uh, uh, speeches to massive people. They called them monster rallies. And they're like, you know, like, like, let's like, take back our land. Let's like, hold on to your homes and this sort of thing. And uh, at the end of one of these meetings, somebody came up to him and said, well, you know, if we get rid of the landlords, who are we going to pay rent to? <laughs> so that's, that's the problem. It's yeah. the mindset. You know, that's the problem. And it's the problem today, actually. It's the same argument is there today. And then the modern example is when I've often talked about Breton laws to, to groups of people or, you know, at events, people would ask the question, like, yeah, but how are you ever going to get the government to bring this back? It's like, well, that's the, that's the wrong uh, question. It's kind of like how, do, how would roads get built without government? Well, people who say that, their imagination's a little bit shrunken at that point. Like they can't even imagine like how it would happen. It's just they 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 see roads. They know government helped with that, and that's how roads are built. And and I think with with the likes of the Breton law and the other native systems of law, which I mean it would be great to talk about as well. But um, is that actually it's the government is is a an ingredient. As an ingredient, the government can't be part of it. It, it, it. it is what it is because it's the absence of state. It's the absence of centralized uh, control. So, so how can we bring it back today? Well, actually, I mean, one way that you can do it is is to start living the principles yourself, right? So, if you have a dispute with somebody, 
maybe let's say you accidentally cause harm are you going to go out and put your hand out to that person and like and offer the hand of peace and say how can i restore this to you are you going to go to the state and you're going to rely on the state to set, step in because we're incompetent and too childlike to do it ourselves that's just one small way but a bigger more impactful way that i see happening now ironically or not ironically like surprisingly is the true technology it's it's it's, it's uh, I, i've spoken about this topic uh, at the hackers congress in 2016 in prague and i have a lot of people in the blockchain area who are like really interested in this idea of Breton law model of governance and um, because um, from what I can gather like these principles that we're talking about non-status solutions to everyday problems uh, are what they're trying to fix with likes of smart contracts with likes of you know private communities online with even like Bitcoin and blockchain uh, uh, you know cryptocurrencies that are unregulated outside the state means of exchange well for in order for that to function and sustain itself for a long time, it needs to have ways to you know solve issues and you know self-executing um, solutions to problems that are going to arise. So I think that's where the 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 the, the, uh, the correlation is there. And um, I know two people are working on two different blockchain projects. One of them is called Higher Vibes, and in his white paper he says the, this is going to be structured on the principles of Breton law. And the other guy is doing sort of like um, a decentralized internet. Um, it's called N22 Made Safe. And within this kind of uh, platform, there's a grading system of status. And he's actually used the words from ancient Ireland. He, he, he's an English guy. He's used the words from ancient Ireland as part of his model of what he's building to me that's amazing that's like it's it is being revived but in a way that couldn't have been uh, expected or imagined you know well we need more Ke kevin flanagan's out there to tell us information i mean this is like i said been endlessly uh, insightful what, what <laughs> so uh, so tell us a little bit before we wrap up um i i want to mention one thing you mentioned to me offline that um you're working on some type of masterpiece maybe just the culmination of all your work is that something you're ready to unveil uh, if if so uh -huh. well uh, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, I was kind of joking when I said masterpiece was like maybe I'll have many masterpieces, but but uh, okay. So I, I set up the, the Breton Law Academy in 2013, pretty much as a response to what I seen was this lack of knowledge, and I had this big passion, and I was like, nobody's talking about this, nobody knows about this. I'm going to make this, and my my goal behind this is to take these ideas, and th there's a lot of material out there, there's a lot of books, but some of them are hard to read and they're hard to get, and not everybody's going to go through them. So I want to take this and put it into modern mediums through, you know, um, audio, through, as you know, interviews like this, uh, making videos and online courses. So uh, my main goal was that I wanted to make a course about Brehan Law that would teach people everything they needed to know from, from A to Z. Uh, when I set out to do this, I realized that in order for that to, to work, I needed to build a lot of context. So before I could talk about the Brehan Law, I actually needed to talk about early Irish society and the TUA and the social system and all of this. Um, so that was the first course that I made back in like 2015, I think. Then that followed up then with the Irish mythology course, which again gives a lot of examples of how the law might have worked in practice through just the art of storytelling. And if now, finally, I feel ready that I'm able to work on the Brehan Law course. So all my courses so far, the other two courses are available on, on Udemy. One's called uh, Ancient Ireland's Culture and Society. The other one is called Irish Mythology. The third one will be on, on uh, Udemy as well, probably be called Brehan Law, Early Irish Legal System or something. Now, does BrehanLawAcademy.ie, does that link back to Udemy or should I link to the Udemy as well? Uh, I can give you the link for the Udemy, but if people go to brehanlawacademy.ie and click on the tab that says Courses, it will bring you to a page that, that basically you can get access to the two courses there. And um, other well, projects. I tell, you, I tell you what, after this conversation, I want to go get the courses down because there's so much history involved that obviously we can't even cover it in an hour. Like you said, you're, I, I could see you sitting there, like you could probably go off another three hours just talking about stuff. So we might need to do another episode. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, and there's a few other projects I'm working on as well. Like, I have a book um, that I'm been writing. Uh, I mean, I, I had a master's to go and do, so that was kind of interrupted. But uh, I want, mm. I'm writing a book right now about Irish place names. Like I mentioned uh, earlier on, there's there's a lot to be learned from them. Um, um, 
are a few different reasons for that. Partly because, like I said, a lot of Irish people aren't using Irish, aren't speaking Irish. So I want to give them a reason to that it's actually useful, the place names. But actually, you can learn a lot about Irish history through the, the families that lived in the land, the mythologies, and, and all of this. So that's that's in the pipeline as well. But you know, it's not it's not a full time. This is not a full time job. It's like a, a you know a, something that I'm passionate about. I would say it's more than a hobby. Um, but you know, right now, like a lot of my focus is going on Students for Liberty, uh, working on developing trainings there. Um, you know, uh, we have a top a top leadership retreat coming up later in the summer, um, and yeah, I mean, I'm very happy to be working with Students for Liberty. I love the work that I'm doing there, and I love I love the mission that they have. So that takes up most of my time, um, and this is kind of on the side. Well, hey, I love what you're doing. I mean, I think anyone listening to this episode most likely is hearing this stuff for the first time. Just imagine, you know, a few hundred more people, a few thousand more people listening to this. It's what it's all we need. So it's been an absolute pleasure having you on, Kevin. Uh, thank you so much for doing this. Thanks so much.